This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 683, recorded on November 18th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's a blue sky, hardly any clouds, 36 Fahrenheit, which is two Celsius. Yeah, it's two Celsius here too. Chilly morning. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. It's uh, 64 degrees in Austin, Texas, clear blue, sunny sky. It is just an absolutely glorious day. Headed for uh, 76 today, and uh, Kate flies over tonight and tomorrow night. We'll be able to see her. <laughs> it's, just, it's just wonderful. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I actually have one Celsius, uh, 34 yeah. Fahrenheit here, um, though it is nice and sunny. Maybe you're in a little Man, valley there. it's cold there. for you guys. Yep, mm -hmm. it's cold, yeah. frozen, ice this morning. Yep, you bet. However, the good thing is most of the leaves have fallen, and that's good for me because I'm the one who cleans them up. You know, there's one tree. I think it's a maple. No, it's an oak. It's kind of young. It's not too tall. The leaves turn brown and they stay on until the spring. Wow. Go figure. And yeah. they're just there and, you know, maybe one or two fall a day. And then all of a sudden in the spring, boom, they all come down. It's weird. I have an oak tree that does that. And, you know, I found that kind of annoying to start with. And then I decided. <laughs> annoying. Nature annoying us. Yes. <laughs> You know, uh, this is nature. You, it's really pretty stupid to be annoyed at nature. No, it's what happens. We have this, uh, I don't know, it's a Japanese maple, the ones with the nice red leaves. Is that oh, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they all dropped at once, and they're gorgeous. They get brighter red on the ground. Really beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah, both of my uh, uh, home screens on my phone and on my iPad are two different things of maples that I, pictures that I took at different times, and suddenly I was looking at them both going, Wow, I have a thing for maple leaves. <laughs> and it, one of them is just that, the Japanese maples yeah. on the leaves on the ground. They're gorgeous. Well, we are halfway through November, and uh, we have a couple more weeks where you can donate to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, and they will match your do donation and give it back to Microbe TV. So you can check that out at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Uh, we have some news this week. Last week, of course, we had Pfizer's announcement about their mRNA vaccine phase three results. And then on early Monday at 6.53 a.m., Moderna <laughs> wow. released. Yeah, it's on the press uh, release. They give you the time because immediately someone told me about it. Uh, mRNA, their mRNA vaccine candidate uh, meets its primary efficacy endpoint in their first interim analysis. Uh, so again, Moderna and Pfizer, mRNA vaccines, mRNA is encoding the spike. They're both in phase three looking for efficacy. And we, last week, and we'll update the Pfizer because they made another announcement today. But last week, the Pfizer was at 90. What was the percentage? Does anyone? 90%. 90. 90% mm -hmm. after 94 people. And so Moderna, 94.5%. Uh, These are remarkable numbers. I mean, the remarkable numbers. Number mm -hmm. of cases are small. So for the, uh, you know, the, the, the Moderna phase three has enrolled 30,000. Uh, participants uh, in the U.S. And this first interim analysis is based on 95 cases. And here they broke it down, 90 in the placebo group and five in the vaccinated group. And that's how you get 94.5%. There is a formula, which we talked about uh, last week. Uh, and um, that's... Um, you know, we had to figure out the numbers for Pfizer, although they give us numbers uh, in their more recent one. We had to back calculate it last week. 
The one and they they don't tell us how many people were in the two groups. I remember we commented on that with Pfizer last week that the control and the vaccine group were very uh, different numbers of people. Yeah, you know this Moderna. They don't even. So there was a hint in the Pfizer announcement, which I'm going to get into in a bit. In this one, they just tell you the total number of people, and they say they did a one-to-one vaccine placebo, so you have to assume it's half placebo and half vaccine. Right. So, uh, But what I find good here in this Moderna, and as you'll see, Pfizer ends up doing the same thing, they tell us about severe, a secondary. So the primary endpoint is, is uh, just COVID-19, just symptomatic uh, disease. And this is, of course, starting two weeks after a second dose. You're going to need two doses of these vaccines. And the secondary endpoint is severe cases of disease. And the, their data included 11 severe cases, all of which were in the placebo group, no severe cases in the mRNA, in the vaccine group. So that's good. That's what Michael Osterholm wanted last week. We mentioned that. And that's really nice. Um Let's see what other things. You know, adverse, no significant safety concerns. Well tolerated. Most of the adverse events: injection site pain, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, headache, etc. And I remember these are small numbers of people, and that may change as we get into millions and millions. Uh, and they these uh, Moderna can make I think twenty five million doses this year, and. Similar numbers for Pfizer and next year, billions, <laughs> a billion doses. Uh, so, you know, everyone's not going to get this right away, uh, but uh, maybe next year sometime should be good. Uh, I want to talk about- Moderna gonna, one also points out their diversity of their uh, yeah. their population. Um, and actually, they're just, it's the diversity of the cases 12 Hispanic or uh, Latinx, four black or African-American, three Asian-American, and one multiracial. And it included 15 older adults Mm -hmm. over 65. So the Moderna says by the end of 2020, we can ship 20 million doses. Uh, And then next year, 500 million to 1 billion doses. And I'm just thinking, these are transcription reactions, in vitro transcription (laughs) And yeah, we've done the, we've done this before. The the calculation we came up with before was to <clears throat> vaccinate the U.S. population with a Moderna vaccine was going to uh, take fifty kilos of RNA. Oh, that was a title, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I was talking to a, a radio show Monday, and I said, L- "Let me put this in perspective." In my lab, when we do these reactions, we're excited to get a millionth of a gram of RNA. <laughs> And they're making kilograms. So I'm really, I'd be curious as, as to how the scale up is working. Yeah, me too. Right? Yeah. I'm very curious. Like about what that. volume are, they're not, we do 50 microliters. <laughs> That's what everybody <laughs> does in their lab to make transcripts. <laughs> and they're not doing lots of little Eppendorf tubes for sure. I'd love to know the scale up. Maybe someday we'll learn. Uh, well, I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if, if it was a lot of small reactions. Yeah, but not I mean, fifty not microliters. Tubes, no. But uh, you know, I, I I seem to recall um, a thing a while a, a long time ago about some sort of uh, expression thing or uh, in either Arthur or Roger. I think it was Arthur Kornberg's lab mm. uh, about doing a, a DNA replication thing where it wouldn't scale up in a larger vessel. So he did, yeah, you know, right. hundreds of smaller reactions. Who knows? Uh, you know, you could also, theoretically at least, you could do it by chemical synthesis. In theory, right? right. But they've uh, said it's but not, I right? I doubt it. I'll bet you they do it by transcription. Ed wants to know what polymerase they use. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, his postdoc project was to work out the purification for T7 RNA uh, polymerase. It's probably T7, right? Probably. Because the other one, SP6, was that it? SP6 polymerase? And there's also T3. There's T3 T3 as well. I think they're not as widely used, right, as T7? I think at this point they're also pretty, I think they've been uh, tweaked. Yeah. Yeah. So So I suppose uh, they could do it in something like 96 well format, (laughs) you know, with robots. (laughs) I I was talking to this radio guy and telling him about the problem with scale-up. He goes, 
yeah, you know, when I when I bake cookies and I just double it, it never works right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a good yeah, analogy. That's like, yeah. Good it's a analogy. good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah you bet. But you know, you're trying to scale up a cake, it falls. You know, you they're injecting a hundred micrograms. And as I say, yeah. we would be happy to make a microgram. Yeah. Uh, much less. Anyway, that's cool. Um and I want to talk about the stability in a bit, but um, the other thing I wanted to point out, um, this was, of course, uh, funded in part by BARDA. They put a lot of money into this. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, and CEPI. CEPI helped pay for the first batch as well. Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, uh, whose CEO was on TWIV when I was in Singapore. So that's cool. It's a nonprofit raising money to do this sort of thing. And this is related to the VRC and Kismiki Corbett, um, our past guest. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Moderna vaccine For sure. comes out of that whole operation. Yep, exactly. All right. So um, I wanted to make an explanation of something now. I Last week on Friday, I believe... Yes, it was Friday. We talked about Pfizer's numbers and how I had back calculated. And people were saying I got the um, numbers wrong to break down between the placebo and the vaccine. So here's how I did it. If you look at the press release from last week, they said... The, the clinical trial phase three has enrolled 43,538 participants, 38,955 of whom have received the second dose of vaccine. So to me, that means 43 minus, minus 38,000 is the, is the placebo group, right? I don't know how else to look at that. I could be wrong, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. If they've enrolled 43,000 participants and 38,000 got a second dose, then the remainder must be the placebo. So that's how I, I did that. And if I could be wrong, but they didn't tell us the breakdown. Well, the funny thing is that later in the article, they said that there were fewer than nine people uh, infected uh, in the vaccine group, okay? Which indicates, you know, if it's 90% effective, that it was, in fact, a one-to-one. -one. I tried to look up on the clinical trial <clears throat> to see uh, what the... Uh, what the breakdown was, and I uh, a quick look, I couldn't find I it. I think it's so one to one. It's ambiguous on the trial so document. That, it's one to one. Yeah, I, I, I think I think in the end, okay, that uh, it is in fact one to one. Is um, it possible that that sentence that says that thirty eight thousand um, have received a second dose um, means that they haven't finished giving everyone the second dose? Out of 43. That's the way I yeah. interpret it. Uh, yeah. So in other words. That they didn't really mean vaccine. They just meant participants. Right, so the control is another 43,000 yeah. is, is saying, right? Okay. It could be. Right. But to right. my, that's how I interpreted it. Either way, it doesn't matter to calculate. You just put those numbers in. You get the same percent efficacy. Uh, so that's how I well, did it. Well, actually, going, th uh, going through the exercise of doing the calculation was interesting in itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so today, uh, Kathy found uh, Pfizer's announcement, 6.59 a.m. <laughs> hey, <laughs> must be a thing to get a it out later. before 7 a.m. Eastern, right? Um, and, and what's the difference between this, Kathy, and last week's Pfizer announcement? Well, this one appears to be the conclusion of the phase three trial. They've reached their, their final endpoint. Um, 170 confirmed cases. I don't know that it's their final endpoint, but it's their well, final checkpoint. Right for the yeah, meeting point, all yeah. primary efficacy yes, endpoints. Right. That's what they say in the headline of the <clears throat> press release. Yeah, so 170 confirmed cases, 162 in the placebo group, and eight in the vaccine group. And so they also uh, have the safety data milestone required by the FDA, EUA. Uh, emergency use authorization. So they have that. Um, they have uh, efficacy was consistent across age, gender, race, and ethnicity demographics. Efficacy in adults over 65 years of age was over 94%. And then uh, well tolerated with, on, with over 43,000 participants enrolled, no serious safety concerns, only grade three adverse event 
greater than 2% in frequency was fatigue at 3.8% and headache at 2%. This is an absolute triumph of yeah. modern science. Oh, it's yeah. Unbelievable. And for those <clears throat> out there who are inclined to deny science, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> because this is is amazing. They're not listening, this Rich. This is just amazing. They're not listening to us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe people know somebody. Okay. And and look what we can do because we had done general basic research on immunology and had tried to do some work on structure of spike and MERS vaccine candidates and things like that. Hey, yeah. and people like Rich and. Uh, Niles, we're working on T7 RNA polymerase, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, what, uh, 50 years ago. And they weren't saying we're going to make a vaccine using this one day. They're saying, right. hey, this no. is a cool enzyme. Let's see how it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of people poo-poo this business of being curious. It's, it, it's not all translational. It's not all driven by some medical need. And when we end up with a vaccine like this, it's often because scientists were being curious and yep. uh, not trying to solve a particular problem. Uh, yeah, for problem. the listeners, to be clear on that uh, uh, thing about T7 RNA polymerase, this, this is all basic molecular biology that comes from studying a virus that infects bacteria, okay? And trying to understand how it works. And not only, I mean, it's not, you know, uh, Niles and to a lesser extent me made a minor minor contribution to this but you know it's one of hundreds of people who are just uh, curious about this uh, and it's 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 more than just the polymerase the promoter the terminator okay uh, the whole T7 transcription system goes into that and it may have for all I know the real enzyme that they're using may be you know, from an, another bacteriophage. It's going to be a bacteriophage. Yep. So the they did, I think, I don't know if you mentioned this, but they did have serious cases in this trial, which was mentioned by Moderna, but not by Pfizer last week, but now 10 severe cases, nine right. in Right, so think about it. This is 10 out of 170, and Moderna had 10 or 11 out of a smaller N. Again, these are small numbers, but... Uh, still looking very safe. Now, it's interesting. One of the severe COVID was in the vaccinated group. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, it's still very good, but it's not 100%. Now, the other, so they're saying in this release now, based on their projections, they can make 50 million doses in 2020, which is more than they had said last week, and 1.3 billion doses uh, by the end of 2021. I think they're getting conned in their pipetting and that's how they're going to make yeah. more doses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised with this uh, kind of success if this didn't get cranked up beyond what their uh, predictions are and just really cranking this stuff Well, out. now you know that you have good numbers. You can say, hey, there's much less risk, right? Well, the interesting thing too is that uh, Pfizer is in, uh, Pfizer, of course, has uh, a network of uh, laboratories globally and production facilities yeah. that they could access to do this. And um, uh, Moderna is in cahoots with a Swiss uh, company called Lanza for the production. And I saw recently an, another group as well, but I-, I Spanish uh, group, yeah. Spanish group, right. Uh, so they have uh, production facilities all over the world as, uh, as well. So uh, given the success of this, I wouldn't be, I'm, I'm totally uh, guessing here, but I wouldn't be surprised if this didn't get cranked up beyond what the original uh, estimates were. Because this is, uh, this is remarkable. It's right. amazing. Also, obviously, because Moderna has the, we only need minus 20 and uh, Pfizer's needs minus 70, minus 80. Yeah. Um, in their press release today, Pfizer says, Pfizer's confident in its vast experience, expertise and existing cold chain infrastructure to distribute the vaccine around the world. Yeah, And, you know, months ago, we saw how FedEx and UPS, uh, you know, were investing in these minus 70 freezer farms. Hmm. So, um, yeah, people are concerned about that cold chain aspect. And I think, you know, another thing Pfizer is most likely going to be doing is figuring out how long 
you know, can their yeah. formulation be stable at minus 20 yeah. and so forth? Uh, yeah, so Monday, Moderna made an announcement. Moderna announces longer shelf life for its vaccine candidate at refrigerated temperatures. So now they say it can remain stable two to two to eight degrees Celsius for 30 days. It's up from seven days and, and, before. Uh, but my question is, how are they measuring that Stability. Efficacy, you know, it's it's not with another trial in people, I'm guessing, but I I don't I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they're running it on a gel. <laughs> 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 or quantifying full length mRNA is not degraded, you know. Yeah. It's a good right. question. Because they're not doing an animal experiment for each of these, <laughs> I think. No. Um shipping in long term storage conditions, minus twenty for six months it will last, so you don't have to do minus seventy. And um that no dilution is needed prior to vaccination. And uh, they say once it's thawed, you know, the doctor's office, they thaw a, a batch. Usually it's coming in multi uh, multi batch vials. After it's thawed, refrigerated two to eight degrees, it'll go up to 30 days within the six month shelf life. Refrigeration. So that's good. And I have a feeling that uh, yeah. once these are opened in the physician's offices, they will be used quickly. <laughs> I'm not going to say. Well, uh, to to me, this is uh, part of the part of the best news because it seems to me that, in a way, potentially the weakest link in the chain is at the end point. Yep. Uh, yep. With yep. individuals handling these things, and to know that it has pretty good stability uh, in the refrigerator and even at room temperature uh, gives me increased confidence that uh, the uh, end delivery is going to be with a viable product. Yeah, that's the thing that worried that worried me with Pfizer was not about whether it could be shipped, but whether my local pharmacy or my yes. local physician's office um, would be able to store at minus eighty. And I'd like to remind people that, uh, geez, probably five or six weeks ago, I think in early October, there was a big dust up because the uh, administration. Uh, started uh, had some sort of pronouncement about how maybe they would have a vaccine available before the election and uh, companies all pushed back and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, the evidence uh, that the um, administration uh, pointed to, uh, to back up their story was the CDC delivering some sort of, or distributing some sort of material, anticipating the delivery of vaccines. But if you, uh, if you look clo more closely at what that was, that was the CDC delivering instructions to everybody who needed them on how to handle either vaccine A or vaccine B that might be delivered at minus 20 C or minus 80 C. Uh, so as we discussed on those shows, this they were actually anticipating this moment, okay, mm -hmm. where vaccine A would be, the minus 20 would be Moderna, vaccine B minus 80 uh, would be the Pfizer vaccine, and good on them, okay, because this was a detailed set of instructions on how to distribute these vaccines and at the end point, how to handle them. OK, so in fact, the CDC is a good month or so ahead of the game uh, in trying to get people up to speed to receive and distribute these vaccines. Also, I'm thinking about uh, I'm not thinking so much about people getting this from their doctor's office. I'm thinking of the Saban oral Sundays when we got the polio vaccine at the high school. You know, it was sort of a, a mass central place where we all went you know, for three successive Sundays or, you know, whatever the time was between them. But, um, and the fact that um, there is a vaccine uh, distribution planning cohort in this administration, and that information is not yet being shared in the transition, um, but, but that this is all uh, being percolated down at the state levels, I think. And so, it may be that, again, this stability at, you know, minus 70 or minus 80 is not going to be an issue if many people are going to go get it at 
you know, a large medical center or um, a gymnasium or whatever. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Kathy. I think that a lot of the distribution uh, issues are going to be worked out at the local level, and there's probably going to be a fair amount of variability in that. It'll be interesting to see how it works out, how, how they actually do it. I remember those polio vaccine yeah. Yeah. campaigns. Yeah. I It'll remember. be interesting to see if this is the same way or whether it's done through. I mean, there's a, a number of, I mean, medicine has changed a lot since then because now we have, for example, uh, I am a member of the Austin Regional Clinic, right, which is one of these huge organizations, one of a couple of different huge organizations that serves the uh, Austin area. Uh, as a you know a health organization, I wouldn't be at all surprised if I didn't get mine distributed through them. On the other hand, for all we know, the Austin Public Health will set up something in a gymnasium or the convention center or whatever. We'll 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 see. Yeah, and just a little insider note: the way that I can remember which vaccine is which is because of that phrase Saban Oral Sunday. Ah, it's <laughs> so funny. Sabin is the oral vaccine, oh, and from yeah. there, it's how that's my mnemonic. I so. totally remember going into the gym, and someone handed me that there was a there were tables covered with little white paper cups, and inside mm -hmm. was a sugar cube, which was mm -hmm. a little yep. pink because of the cell culture medium, and you just ate it. I just remember that. I think doing it in schools is a good idea. Uh, I think many vaccines would benefit by being given in schools because as we talked about on a, that TWIV we did on vaccines, Rich, at Irvine, uh, some people find it hard to bring their kids multiple times to doctor's appointments and having them at schools might really help uh, on the uptick. So, yeah. and, and by the and way- And I'm also just thinking that we're going to need this to be physically distanced. Yes, so for sure. So having it in a large venue is going to be for important. Sure. Yep. <laughs> You don't want to be transmitting it in the line to get the vaccine. And the other thing, Rich, is that this is remarkably close to the election, but only, I think, because of the uptick in the number of infections. That's accelerated these trials. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it would have happened much later. So yeah. yeah, there you go. So I have another little anecdote here. As, as I've been saying, we've been, I've become more or less addicted to the PBS NewsHour. And the other day, they inter uh, they interviewed one of their correspondents, John Yang, who uh, per is, is a participant in the Moderna trial. Mm. And he described his experience. And he said when he got his first injection, he went home that night and he didn't feel anything. He was kind of disappointed. <laughs> 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 but then the next day, he said it just uh, laid him out, you know, fever, malaise. He had to go to bed. Okay. And so he says, Yes. I probably got it. He wasn't sure. And he said, interestingly, the um, when he got his booster, uh, he got a much quicker response and uh, not as intense and was over quicker. So it all, you know, I mean, this is all anecdotal, right? He, for all we know, he got the placebo. But from his description, I doubt it. Uh, but I thought it was interesting, uh, too, to, uh, you know, hear somebody's experience um, with uh, perhaps getting a vaccine and, and what it was like. So. Rich, yeah, uh, I know somebody who's in the AstraZeneca trial and uh, got their first immunization and said, must have just gotten a salt water because it's just a tiny little pink pinprick. But there, um, the odds are two to one. They're giving the vaccine to twice as many people as are getting the placebo. I'm shaking, you know, we did a paper once where the placebo was actually another vaccine, right? Right. Yes. Right. And right. I'm thinking that was the Chadox one. Yes. But what a yeah. great right. opportunity to immunize that, people. That, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rich, do you think that the difference in stability between the Pfizer and Moderna product has to do with formulation of the nanoparticle at all? I saw in the show notes that you thought I might know the answer to this, and I don't. <laughs> All right. I, I have seen something to that effect somewhere yeah. in the press. So uh, yeah, and I don't. You know, the uh, I seem to recall that if you uh, really try and get down to the details of what's in these lipid nanoparticles, uh, you run across the word proprietary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, so I don't think you can. Uh, I don't think at least I can figure out exactly. Uh, what the differences are, uh, or and and in fact, I was having I was on a, a call last night with another group where we were wondering about the 
uh, whether there's any specific targeting in these things. And when they're injected intramuscularly, what cells are actually taking them up and how? And I don't know the answers to those questions. All I know is that they're lipid nanoparticles. And I don't know whether there are differences in the composition that accounts for the presumed differences in, in stability. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, once this all sorts itself out, that in fact, they wind up to be equivalently stable. I just don't know. Yeah. So Lonza makes transfection reagents um, that, you know, you can buy for transfection and cell culture. Um, and so I've in some ways imagined the nanoparticle um, as being like that. As far as the cell type thing, um, I did some reading about this Um partially because when I was in graduate school, one of my fellow students was very interested in the exact same question for DNA vaccines, since our lab was doing DNA vaccines. So I knew that that literature and tried to read the mRNA literature, it seems very similar, um, that some of the cells are going to be uh, transfected myocytes that got damaged um, from the injection, and then the rest are going to be local dendritic cells that are going to endocytose. Okay, um, good. And that, that lipid is likely going to um, enhance endocytosis um, by the dendritic cell. Okay, so that makes sense. So those would be... Uh... Are, uh, can I call those antigen presenting cells? You can call those antigen presenting cells. <laughs> would I be correct? <laughs> you would. <laughs> okay, good. So are they going to? Are they going to? There and uh, are they going to make their way to lymph nodes? Um, yes, they should make their way to lymph nodes. In the DNA vaccine studies that um, my lab mate did, um, he actually looked for protein um, and found a lot more protein at the site than he hmm. did in the lymph node. Um, I have not seen similar studies um, with the mRNA vaccines, although I assume someone somewhere has done them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rich, the formulations have to be different between Moderna and Pfizer. They can't make the same thing because uh, that they, would, yeah, they wouldn't be there the would same, be an right? IP be exactly issue, the right? So they have to be different and maybe that accounts for the stability. Who knows? Yeah. Or, it, or it could be that Pfizer hasn't done the stability tests to know. Well, that, that's kind of part of what I've been thinking. On the other hand, geez, that, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, it, yeah. you, yeah, you think they would have done it. Yeah. They're a big company. Uh, given, given, I mean, it's it. obvious what the consequences yeah, are. For sure. It's a, you know, not a, not a great, uh, a thing to have the, uh, have to distribute them at the super low temperature. So at any rate, we'll see. So I, I have a question. Do we think that, the apparent success of these two vaccines will have any impact on vaccine design, particularly against emerging pathogens in the future? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah I think a lot of people <laughs> will, think so. will try this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think existing vaccines will stay the way they are, especially the successful ones, right? But I think, yeah, I think people will try them, but I don't think they'll work for every vaccine, right? I don't uh, think they will either, um, but I do think that this is sort of also exciting because it may open up the ability to make some vaccines that we have not previously yeah. been able to make. I think in the press from release from Pfizer, they said it's a new vac it's a new therapeutic platform. It is. I'm gonna yep. now have a thing in my vaccines lecture on mRNA vaccines, right? <laughs> well, and wouldn't this be the way to make uh, influenza vaccines before we have universal ones? If you want to make them to each emerging hemagglutinin, this yeah. might be a way to go. Yeah. I, so I'm looking at the uh, Moderna pipeline. Uh, so. What is that? How they treat their sewage? <laughs> <laughs> CMV, Zika, uh, para influenza virus. Uh, this is the one I'm really interested in uh, pediatric uh, respiratory syncytial virus, influenza H7N9, Epstein Barr virus. These are all mRNA vaccines they're working on. Uh, so, uh, hey, maybe I, this will get people excited about a vaccines. Me at all if this becomes ultimately a dominant technology, and I'm I'm really interested to see how an RSV, uh, a respiratory syncytial virus, would turn out because the vaccine would turn out because that's been problematic historically. Uh, whether yeah, this is going to uh, uh, address those problems or not, I don't know. This has been in development before, long before this. Yeah. Obviously, the RS was the precursor for the, you know, the prefusion spike confirmation and mRNA encoded. All that's been published, yeah. And I think Kismikia was working on that as well. 
She was. Yes. With, with Barney Graham and all that. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I hope Great this will stuff. get people. It's maybe so this, exciting. Maybe this will get more people excited about vaccines who currently are not, right? Yeah. Maybe I this will so. get more people uh, interested in or paying attention to science. That would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice. I have my doubts. We can dream, though. can't we? We'll just use TWIV <laughs> as a barometer. If we see, you know, the the downloads go tank after these vaccines come out, we know the answer to that question. <laughs> we'll see. As as we said last time, we'll be here, and so will the viruses. <laughs> uh, I do have a. We do have a couple of papers to chat with you about. But last thing, I wanted to give you an update on my uh, SARS-CoV-2 test results. So remember, a couple of weeks ago. I had a false positive, or what I th thought was a false positive PCR test, which I documented on YouTube. And uh, a company, person in a company heard me talk about that and sent me a rapid lateral flow antibody test, <laughs> which I did yesterday. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> take a little, it comes with a lancet, you poke your finger, you take the blood, there's a little pipette, you draw up a tiny amount of blood, you put it in the lateral flow, you put a drop of buffer in, 10 minutes, there's three things. There's a control line that shows you the assay works. In other words, I think this is a this contains antigen, spike antigen, and if you have antibodies, it's going to bind that. And there's a control line, there's an IgM line, an IgG line. So mine just had a control line. No IgG, no IgM. So I have no antibodies According to this test, now there is a certain uh, failure rate, right, or false negative rate, which theoretically I could be in, but I, I think it's clear that uh, likely clear that I have no antibody, so I didn't have an asymptomatic infection either. Okay, that's the story. So, so uh, they only sent you that one test. You didn't get to do Ian as a control. <laughs> I have one more cassette left. I could go over and uh, and do Ian. Yeah, yeah, give it to Ian. Um, he probably would like to do that. I actually film the whole thing and I'm going to get permission from the company to, to release it as a, like a, an educational video. I'm going to explain how the test works and all of that stuff and show blood coming out of my finger. Um, but yeah, it's cool. It can work. Um, and there, this is something you can do at home. Um, people always do finger sticks for all sorts of uh, things right at home. So yep. I like it. I think it's cool. A couple of papers for your pleasure today. Uh, the first one, science translational medicine. Prothrombotic autoantibodies in serum from patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Now I'm going to say this is a highly clinical paper. And there's some of you out there who are clinicians and don't, don't, and, and apparently bells go off <laughs> in your head when we wander into this stuff, <laughs> to which I say, <laughs> Why not? Why, why can't we talk about it? And if we make mistakes, just tell us. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry about the bells in your head. <laughs> Alarms. Um, this is from a group. Of, oh, my. Why? Well, look, somebody's from Ann Arbor. Look, Kathy. There, it's, the group is from the University of Michigan. The two senior authors are Yugendra Kanthi and Jason Knight. And the first author is Yu Zhou. He goes by Ray. You know these people at all? I do not. All right, so uh, as as you uh, have heard for sure, and certainly Daniel Griffin has mentioned this, many patients with COVID-19, they have abnormal coagulation. And in particular, in fact, Daniel, and also we had a couple of surgeons on some time ago who also talked about uh, venous thromboembolism, right? Blood clots in patients with COVID-19. Uh, and this, of course, is problematic because it can occlude vessels and it can cause strokes and myocardial infarctions and so forth. And uh, this is clear. It happened. I mean, Daniel's talked about people who uh, have clots uh, and they, that's why they use anticoagulants. And to, to, yeah, this to is one of his that. unique phases. And, and he talks also about having a problem because when you're on anticoagulants, he had a few patients who then started bleeding into their thigh or their abdomen because, you know, you always have these micro uh, capillary breaks and without clotting, they never seal up. So it's a double-edged sword. Anyway, um, ha, you know, this paper address tries to get at what's going on here. And there are a couple of mechanisms, right? 
Um, there, you can we could blame the cytokine storm, which <laughs> we like to blame on a lot of things uh, that attracts clotting components, right? Um, and in fact, uh, another aspect of, of what might be involved are this cool things called neutrophil extracellular traps or nets, which we've talked about a lot on TWIM. Um, neutrophils throw out these, you know, if you think of a fisher person throwing out a net, just think of the neutrophil throwing out a net made mostly of DNA to capture, you know, organisms. Uh, in the blood. So uh, actually, <laughs> uh, we can talk about those. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to talk about those. You here can or talk not, about but, them uh, now. I, 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 I hadn't. Sorry, I haven't been listening to Twim or whatever. Okay, <laughs> but so this was uh, it's your this loss, was man. News to me. It's your loss. So this, these nets that the mm -hmm. neutrophils make, uh, 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 a fundamental, a big component of those is chromatin. It is, yes. Okay, so, so this DNA and protein, which obvious, which is obvious, well, obvious to me, would make a big fibrous network, basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I, as I, if I understand it correctly, the mechanism, uh, or at least one of the mechanisms, is suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you're not gonna, you're not gonna throw out a bunch of chromatin and survive. <laughs> basically, you're gonna lice. Okay, break apart. And spew out all this chromatin. So it's even, it's it's beyond barfing. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the technical term is netosis. 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 Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. Yes, I encountered that. So it's a a particular. It's a specific type of cell death, right? That results in the release of these networks. So this is another great example. First of all, neutrophils like macrophages blow my mind because these are these individual cells that are on their own trip with my genome in them <laughs> running around doing this work for me. Not only that, they're committing suicide for my benefit. Okay. It's wonderful. Yeah. And throwing out these networks. The, and they're pretty cool. So they're so if you look at sort of all the white blood cells in your blood, they're oh, maybe 50% of them, they're they're kind of in the majority compared to some of the others. Um, and they're all really short-lived. So the idea is that they live for a really short time, deal with some microbes, and then die potentially by netosis. Um, I learned the hard way. They So dead neutrophils together are generally pus. Okay. Um, that, that's basically a collection of dead neutrophils. Um, when putting this together in a slide uh, for your students, um, do not do a Google image search for pus. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now everybody is yeah, stopping just, just their recording and they're okay, going right now okay, to do that. But instead of doing that, that Google image search, you should do a search for um, neutrophil nets. Um, in most of the immunology textbooks, there are some beautiful images of them. Um, mm -hmm. And the images of these big neutrophil nets sort of trapping lots of different uh, bacteria are really striking. Um, and as soon as you see one, you say, oh, my gosh, that looks like a really useful form of defense. Two things I think are cool about it. One is that they made the acronym be so descriptive. So it stands for uh, neutrophil extracellular traps, N-E-T, and so they become nets. It's really perfect. I think Dixon would even appreciate that. Um, and then the second thing is, we'll get to this a little bit later, but how you can assay for them is for this enzyme uh, abbreviated MPO or myeloperoxidase. And I was looking that up and its older name is verdoperoxidase, which is because it has a hemoglobin form that's green. green. Yeah. And so this explains the green of pus and mucus. So Lovely. if you don't want to remember MPO for myeloperoxidase, you can remember verdoperoxidase, green pus and mucus. Nice. Just By the way, uh, Rich, I, I understand you can't listen to other podcasts. However, on TWIM, we are very serious, just as we are on TWIM. <laughs> so it's not like we don't fool around. So, we, we, we do actually so, discuss uh, science. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing occurs to me is that this is uh, science coming full circle because DNA was first identified by Friedrich uh, Meischer or Meischer yeah. uh, in the late 1800s. He extracted it from pus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. yep. Good point. Okay, back to uh, clotting. So 
cytokine storm, nets. Also, antibodies, self, anti-self antibodies could be involved in clotting. And that's the topic of this paper. For example, um, if you make antibodies to your phospholipids, that is, in, in one case, an acquired thrombophilia. So a thrombophilia is when you clot all the time. It's a disease and you can have... It can be genetically transmitted uh, to offspring. One in 2,000 individuals may have this antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, they make antibodies, autoantibodies. That means antibodies against your own uh, molecules, which you shouldn't be doing. That's supposed to be no-no. You know, as your thymus <laughs> develops and your T cells, you're supposed to throw out the ones that are self-reactive, but sometimes things go wrong as, you know, it's biology. <laughs> Not everything Same works. Same in the bone marrow and the B cells. <laughs> Perfectly, yeah. So you can make autoantibodies to phospholipids and phospholipid binding proteins like prothrombin. And there's there's thrombin that could ring a bell about clotting and another one called beta-2 glycoprotein. These antibodies, autoantibodies against these self components will bind to cell surfaces, right? They'll activate endothelial cells, they will activate platelets, they will activate neutrophils, and they will, as they say, tip the blood endothelium interface towards thrombosis. I like that. It's a nice little phrase, right? Um, right. This this research group, their specialty is is studying these kind of autoantibodies. So that's where they're coming into this SARS-CoV-2 story right. from. And um, they mention something that I just would hate to be a patient to be diagnosed if I got told that I had hmm. the catastrophic variant yes. of antiphospholipid yeah. syndrome. That's... Um, it's frequently fatal, but just having the catastrophic variant as part of the name. Uh, yeah. So these autoantibodies, a lot of them are to phospholipids and once again, for the, for the lipid, uh, lipids, for the listeners, <laughs> phospholipids are what make up cell membranes. Okay. So that's why, these phospholipids are going to interact with the uh, yeah. with the surface of the cells, so that's uh, that's not good. And phospholipids. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is in the, in the introduction, <clears throat> they talk about the uh, clotting irregularities in the SARS-CoV-2 patients don't fit the normal paradigm for cl uh, clotting abnormalities. Uh, so they maintain, patients maintain normal concentrations of coagulation factors, uh, fibrinogen platelets, suggesting that COVID-19 induces a unique prothrombotic state that is distinct from traditional descriptions of sepsis-induced coagulopathy, which is a long way of saying this is uh, peculiar to this virus infection. Maybe we ought to look for some mechanism that's, uh, you know, off the normal pathways. Yeah, it's not just the sort of cytokine storm related coagulation. It's something different. And this is a great example of how, you know, this this syndrome, COVID-19, is attracting people with different expertises as we reveal new aspects of the disease. Now, here we have, as Kathy said, people who are experts at studying these diseases caused by antibodies to phospholipids and phospholipid binding proteins. That's what you want. You want experts. Now, they're not virologists, right? That's other people, but the virologists can't do this or they're not qualified because these are the experts. And so that's the beauty, I think, is that we can engage all these different and aspects uh, of science. So, Brian, these... this and other things that we've gone through is uh, it, um, making me think that this distinction between self, the immunological distinction between self and other is not as black and white as I really wanted it to be. Oh, no, it is not as black and white <laughs> at all. Um, and in fact, uh, when those B cells and T cells develop, um, you know, and are let out of the bone marrow or thymus, they are really right on the edge um, of potential autoreactivity. Uh, and uh, it is not at all black and white. And, you and it's can, not uh, over when I'm born. It is right? not over when you're born. There are all sorts of ways that sort of backup measures and safeguards um, that are trying to make sure that you stop uh, responses to self. But you can have uh, changes it, throughout your life, too. Uh, okay. And some of those changes can be transient, right? I can mm -hmm. have a transient 
autoantibody thing. Yeah, and you okay? could get infected, and that could trigger it, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So Damn. you're lucky you're alive, Rich. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we, there, there's actually a, a point in immunology where I talk about this this exact thing in T cell development, and the students all kind of look at me like, wait. Why am I not dead? Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a moment where they're just like, wait a minute. Yeah. It's, uh, it's called evolution. Uh, it, it's working. But humans are doing their best to not make it work, right? By messing with other things. Anyway, so there have been now in the literature reports of antiphospholipid antibodies in COVID-19. And uh, so that's what this paper is looking at. Uh, they do... Uh, they look in patients basically for these kinds of autoantibodies and they find them. And then they actually do um, a, a, an experiment, an intervention in mice where they ask, do these antibodies actually do something that we think they do? It's cool. I have serum from 172 patients that uh, were hospitalized with COVID-19 and they looked for eight different types of antiphospholipid antibodies. Yeah, yes, there are more than eight types. <laughs> it's amazing. 19% um, of these patients died. 8% remained in the hospital at the time of this study. 89 patients were positive for at least one type of antiphospholipid antibody. It's 52% of the entire cohort. And they list all the different kinds and their prevalences. I don't think we need to tell you that. Um, but Yeah, I, I think the take-home message is that yeah, 52% of these hospitalized yeah. patients Have were positive antibody. for these kinds of antibodies. And the majority of positive samples were associated with three types of autoantibodies, and they, they list them all out there, and they're IgG and IgM uh, antibodies. Okay, so they're there. Uh, do they associate with clinical characteristics? In other words, if you have some uh, form of COVID, do you have a certain kind of autoantibody? And so they looked at the correlation... Uh, between the presence of these elder antibodies and certain clinical characteristics, including oxygen saturation, the ratio of oxygen saturation to the fraction of inspired oxygen. In other words, oxygenation efficiency, C-reactive protein in the serum, D-dimer concentration, platelet counts, neutrophil counts, uh, calprotectin in the serum. That's a marker of neutrophil activation. And myeloperoxidase, which Kathy mentioned, a marker of netosis. Oh, these great words. <laughs> um, so calprotectin was most consistently associated with the presence of uh, anti-phospholipid antibodies, in other words, neutrophil uh, ac activation. Uh, remember, these are associations. You're not proving anything. They're just saying when we have these antibodies, this is what we see. And of course, in the future, you have to try and tease it out further, but it's a start. Um, other clinical variables, a positive test for any antibody was associated with a higher calprotectin in serum and a lower uh, glomerular filtration rate. So if you have clots, I guess that's going to lower the filtration rate, right? Uh, oxygenation efficiency tended to be impaired in patients with uh, these antibodies. Uh, and um, basically the presence of an antibody against phospholipid uh, in these patients uh, correlated with various clinical characteristics, especially neutrophil activation and impaired renal function. All right. Now, let's talk about NETs. Uh, one prothrombotic function of these antibodies, these autoantibodies, is to trigger the release of NETs. And uh, they they have actually detected nets in, in serum of patients with COVID-19. Uh, and so they said, maybe if we purify the IgG from these patients, maybe it can trigger net release. So they took, uh, they purified IgG uh, from a couple of patients and they did an in vitro net release assay, which uh, Kathy said is, is measured by myeloperoxidase activity. Uh, released into the supernatant after digestion of the net with microcockle nuclease. Microcockle is, a, is for us old folks. We always used to use. <laughs> Such a cool <laughs> enzyme. <laughs> I still use it now. Really? Yeah. Mm. What do you do with it? Um, make nucleosomes. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm trying to think, you know, I used to have a stock of aliquot of microcochal nuclease that I used routinely for something. I can't remember what it, <laughs> what it was. So you they, so basically you have neutrophils and they add these IgG, purified IgG, and they measure uh, myeloperoxidase activity. And um, they found that the release of nets uh, from neutrophils isolated from he healthy individuals doubled when they were cultured with uh, IgG from COVID-19 patients that were shown to be positive for these anti-phospholipid antibodies. And that they, as their control, they have antibodies from patients with uh, either an anti-phospholipid syndrome or an catastrophic syndrome, which they know uh, are, are present. And, and they also catalyze an increase in the release of uh, NETs. Uh, then there's a drug called dipyrimidol, dipyridamol, which is used to treat uh, thrombosis. And this has been shown to attenuate net release. And in this set of experiments, it also does the same thing as well. So it's cool. It's the target so of this drug. What's the relationship between the nets and the thrombosis? Are they sort of a scaffold that promotes the clotting or uh, is, uh, you know, I mean, they, they are a yeah, fibrous they network themselves. I mean, they're going to trap cells, including platelets, right, and trigger the formation of clots, right, Brianne? That is what I understand, although, you know, I have certainly been sitting here thinking about similar kind of questions. Yeah. Um, so I think we can still answer more on that. So my other question is, how does a virus uh, trigger the production of these autoantibodies? Well... That is the question, isn't it? <laughs> that is exactly the question. We have no idea. Well, we have ideas, but we don't know the answer. And that's what... So a, a typical explanation for the relationship between a virus infection and the production of any kind of autoantibody is that the virus makes um, uh, proteins that contain epitopes that uh, you make antibodies to that cross-react with self, mm -hmm. okay? But I don't know if that works for this or whether it's causing some sort of dysregulation of the immune system somehow. Yeah, so the the cross-reactivity idea is one idea, um, but just like I mentioned before, that there were a bunch of overlapping ways that um, we keep your cells from... Uh, detecting self mm. throughout your life. Um, some of those could get messed up by, say, um, strong cytokine responses or something like that. Okay. Um, is sort of the idea, but it's still never um, totally uh, clear. Um, a couple of months ago, now I guess, I don't remember when, um, there were those papers about interferon and COVID 19, um, one of which talked about. COVID-19 patients have it, severe COVID patients having um, anti-interferon antibodies. Um, and they, there was sort of some discussion about whether uh, those antibodies were the result of COVID or uh, a cause um, in some cases. And so I, there was a little bit of literature and discussion about it, that exact issues then. Um, but I think that's something we need to figure out a lot more about. Um, and I was thinking about that as well when we had the conversation about long COVID uh, last week. But I think I'm I really, following on your uh, comments, I think um, looking for these antibodies in patients might be a way to stratify them according to risk, right? Mm -hmm. and since we now know uh, that they correlate point. with syndromes and they say this in the discussion, <laughs> and then you can treat them differently, give them this drug or other anticoagulants, right? Because exactly. if you don't have any of these autoantibodies, then you're not at risk for clots. Maybe uh, that's it's really important. I think I really like this paper. I think that yes. there's uh, first of all, it was different. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's uh, you know there's obviously a lot of work to done to, to be done. This isn't the final answer, but it also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when Daniel has talked about the coagulopathies, he has mm -hmm. mentioned that it doesn't it doesn't really fit the normal paradigm yeah. of a coagulopathy. And this, this provides a mechanism, at least, you know, with some yeah. 
a mechanism some gaps yeah. in it for how the virus could do this uh and 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 a way to a way to look at it i i found the paper fascinating well the virus wouldn't yeah. do it it would lead to the production yeah. of clots yes right i'm right. sorry no, i'm I, sorry I've read about some other things about some of these antiphospholipid antibodies, and I, I find them generally kind of interesting. So I was excited to read this paper. I have to say the experiments they did with the mice, um, where they took the patient serum and put it into mice to look for thrombosis in mice, yeah. um, really made me excited. I was I thought that was a great experiment. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. But I just want to mention that the surgeons who were on TWIV said, this is not your normal um, pneumonia. We have clotting in the small right. vessels of the alveoli, right? right. That's, that's related to this. So the the final set of experiments, well, these are the experiments. Everything else is an observation so far, right? Um, and whether these IgG from patients could accelerate the formation of clots thrombosis. So they first do an in vitro self-free thrombin generating assay. Um, and uh, th th it didn't work. The IgG from these patients didn't accelerate the formation of clots, but they were not perturbed. They said, let's look in mice. Uh, and there are various mouse models of thrombosis. There is an inferior vena cava model uh, where you put a copper wire in the inferior vena cava, right? And that damages the endothelium and causes clot formation. Um, and uh, so when they added... IgG, does anyone hear like wind? Yes, yes. I do. Hmm. I know it's windy out, but I'm in the basement. <laughs> 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 when they add IgG from their COVID-19 patients with, with uh, antibodies to these phospholipids, uh, it increases the, the formation of the clot. So you put the copper wire in, you get a clot form, and it's bigger when you put the serum in uh, from these patients. And at the same time, the... Um, uh, they can find net remnants in mouse serum, right? Because this is also stimulating netosis and they can find those and they go up uh, when you add the serum from patients. All right. And then they have another mouse model for thrombosis where the inferior vena cava is narrowed uh, distal to the renal vein by a suture. They They put a suture over a spacer and then they take it out and that damages it and it causes the formation of a thrombus. And then uh, they call this the stenosis model of thrombosis. And again, IgG from these patients also increases uh, thrombosis extension. So two experiments in mice showing that these sera with antiphospholipid antibodies stimulate, increase the formation of clots. That's pretty cool. They show pictures of the clots too from these experiments. They have a nice diagram of what the these uh, <clears throat> manipulate, surgical manipulations are, and then they have pictures of the clots. Yeah, I know, and they're impressive. amazing. <laughs> Big clots. Yep. Huge. So don't put a copper wire in your inferior vena cava. Not a good idea. Anything else on this before we move on? Uh, yeah, I just another <laughs> uh, uh, personal observation. I, I have to say that when this paper first came up, this is I, I enjoy observing what happens to my head. <laughs> as I learned this stuff, okay? And when the paper first came up and they were talking about autoantibodies to phospholipids, I'm going, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 I'm not, you know, I started off thinking this has got to be nonsense, all right? And when I was done, I was going, holy cow, this is really pretty cool. Oh, I can show you some literature about some of these similar antibodies in HIV, Um they're, the cardiolipin antibody is pretty well studied. Crazy. All right. One thing, uh, you were mentioning the stratifying of people based on whether they have these antibodies, but I maybe you said it and I missed it, but they talk about also characterizing convalescent plasma for whether it has oh, these yes, antibodies. Oh, yes, right. That's really important. Mm -hmm. So that that is going to be important because you wouldn't want to be adding yes. that in. Good point. Yep. Yeah, we have brought that up with Daniel because... Yeah, these sera have uh, not just clotting factors, which is a problem to give to people, right? But antibodies, yes, to phospholipids. So they have to be checked. And, you know, the, the convalescent sera trials have not worked out all that well, and they've caused some problems in patients, likely because of this. And Daniel's mentioned that. So I frankly would rather put a monoclonal in 
And then someone said, well, it's too, you know, convalescent serum is cheaper. I, if I had my choice, I'd take a monoclonal because it's purified. There's nothing else in yeah. it, right? It's a good point. Yeah, I wanted to mention that and forgot. Good. Uh, the second paper is something unusual for us because it's actually a literature survey, but it really takes a look at all the possible places where SARS-CoV-2 might be in the human body. And I think that's neat to go over in some way. Yeah, it's, is, it's really neat. Pl it's in plus a, pathogens, so it's open access. Yeah, so people can get, take a look at it. And there's two nice images um, associated with it. So you should check this out. On the whereabouts of SARS-CoV-2 in the human body, a systematic review from uh, Ghent University and Ghent University Hospital in Belgium. Tri Tri Tripstein is the first author. Isn't that something? Almost Tripson. Tripstein mm -hmm. and the last author <laughs> is Van der Van der Chkov. Van der Kerkhove. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have to just say at the outset, I have observed the one thing in um, the course of this pandemic and, and specifically scientific research on it, that people have come into the field who are not virologists, and that's great, as we just said in the last paper. However, I want them to understand that having a receptor for a virus present on the cell is does not mean that that cell is going to be infected. And there are papers published galore looking at ACE2, the, the cell receptor for SARS-CoV-2, and all sorts of tissues and making conclusions. And it's not enough. Once the virus particle gets into a cell, there are other things that need to be present in order for it to multiply and make new virus particles. And people, many people seem to forget that. Not virologists, of course. We all understand that you need both a receptor and a permissive internal cellular environment. But yet, so many papers, oh, there's ACE2 here, it could be a problem. Please think about post ACE2, okay? Uh, and they, in a very author summary, uh, we observed that SARS CoV 2 uh, impacts the human body way beyond the lungs. It's not correlated with ACE. J just keep that in mind, okay? It's not just ACE. But the problem is we have ACE, we have probes for ACE, we have antibodies, we can look for the nucleic acid, and all the other stuff we don't know anything about, the post entry issues. So it's hard, but. Okay, so that was my little complaint. I, what I thought you were going to say is that uh, that there's been so much literature because they start out with this the search terms that they use and they pull out 11,700 identified articles uh, that, <laughs> that they had to then uh, whittle down. And they, they do that pretty quickly with some inclusion and exclusion criteria. But yeah, yeah. No, no wonder a, we've been kind of overwhelmed and can't cover sure, everything. Yeah, it. it's amazing. Uh, so, so this is another uh, thing that struck me about this, and that is that it's uh, it, this represents a certain style of scientific publishing. Yeah. Uh, in particular, a style of a review. You know, in my lifetime, when you write a review, you just you have all this literature around, you have a lot of knowledge, and you just kind of write this thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, over the last few years, I've encountered this other paradigm, which is in particular in the modern age, when you write a review, you uh, do this uh, incredible computer-based search of the literature, yeah. and then yeah. you filter through that using other algorithms as well. And in writing a review, you actually publish that as part of your methods, mm -hmm. how you actually yeah. did the literature search, which is unfamiliar to me, but uh, quite familiar as I've learned. Of to course, pre-internet when you did a literature review, you typically went to the library right. and looked up paper. And I remember going into dusty stacks and you yep. find, then you find another, you go back and forth. And then at some point, remember that little pamphlet, that booklet that got published by ISI mm -hmm. that had- In Index Medicus. Then that well, came Garfield, up. Garfield, current contents. Current too. contents. Yeah. And you could start looking at that and find what you needed. That was kind of a revolution. And then of course, all that is supplanted by- uh, PubMed and so you could forth. also go to the library and have librarians help you do keyword searches because mm -hmm. we did that and generated some stacks of papers and then we had to go to PubMed to pull them. My, out. Uh, my uh, Vincent, you trigger a bunch of <laughs> actually quite fond memories. My memory of the dusty libraries, you know, you'd have a study carol. 
right? Yeah. Where there's a desk with a shelf above it. And I would go to do research for a paper or something like that. And I would pull journals off the shelves and they would land on this shelf on the top of the study carol. And I would know that I had pretty much completed my uh, literature <laughs> research when I found that all of the references in any given article would refer back to papers in the journals that I'd already picked yeah, up. Yeah, that's right. That stuff. So once that's I right. saturated that and I was not picking out any new journals, I knew I was done. <laughs> the other thing that reminds me of is, depending on the library, some libraries, they want you to re-stack the volumes, right? But others right. say, leave them in the carrow because you're going to screw it up and we need to do it right. You, you right. guys remember right. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is, I guess, true confession time. Um, I do remember all of this. Uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, on work study, that was one of my tasks in the lab was that sometimes um, people in the lab would give me their list of papers mm. and I would get my little cart and go through the library and find the journal and make photocopies. Um, and maybe about the time I was a sophomore, I learned about this thing called PubMed mm. where I could get the papers <laughs> on the internet and not yeah. actually go to the library. Um, but the other members of the lab didn't really understand. And so they, they were amazed. I, I was known for being so quick at getting all their papers. They just couldn't <laughs> quite understand how I it was Secrets. so magical. Yeah. Secrets. The other thing they use in this paper is something called the snowball method. And so I looked it up. That's an actual search method that I could find on the internet. And basically, it's that you consult the bibliography of articles that you already have mm. to see if there's anything mm. else. It's a so, good method. So the yeah. point of this is to look at papers that look for what they call viral presence in a, in a variety of human tissues and body fluids throughout the body. And that presence can be infectivity, not mostly not, but infectivity could be viral proteins, viral nucleic acids. And they ended up with 186 articles, right? And that forms the basis for this. And then and they- I really appreciate this because this has been a question yeah. as to what extent is the virus actually disseminated into yes. other tissues. That's right. Okay. And they've done a really nice job here, I think, of reviewing the literature. So they say the detection was done with RT. QPCR, microscopy, uh, viral RNA protein being the most p popular techniques. It's important to note that these techniques do not offer definitive proof for the presence of infectious virus. Therefore, we summarize the level of evidence for each organ system. Good for them. Right. right. And they state it throughout. When they go through each organ system, they talk about, oh, but this is not infectious virus. Yes, this is good. just RNA. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, these are... It's really still early because we asked Tony Fauci, right? Where does else does the virus reproduce other than the respiratory tract? He said, well, we're not sure. We haven't done enough autopsies. We're, we have to look for particles or infectious virus. So it's just really an early. He did, however, and I was a little surprised by this. He did suspect that there was going to be, turn out to be some genuinely disseminated infection, at least some other targets outside of the respiratory system. And I, I was a little surprised by that, but- here we are. All right. So the, obviously the, the main target is the respiratory yeah. tract, and they go through the variety of cell types, uh, which clearly are involved in reproduction, the nose, pharynx, trachea, and lungs, um, viral RNA and or antigens, mainly in ciliated respiratory epithelial cells, pneumocytes, alveolar macrophages. Um, they talk about virus, infectious virus pres presence in mucus. I don't want to really talk too much about that. We've talked about a lot, but I wanted to look elsewhere. Um, cardiovascular system. About 20% of patients who end up in ICU have developed acute cardiac injury. And they say whether that's direct damage by virus or an Im immune activation is unknown. Although last week or the week before, I guess we talked about the two papers, which the one which had had the case study where the lady died of a, I don't know, we have a correction on what we say. A heart problem. Heart problem, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps caused by fusion of uh, cardiomyocytes by the spike protein. And then also suggesting that those mini hearts in culture could be infected. But I don't know that, I mean, they say here that 
there's very little evidence for direct reproduction of the virus in hearts from patients, right? And I think that the one paper, now remind me, I don't know who, I think Rich and Brianne were there on that when we talked about the, the fusion of cardiomyocytes. Did they show virus? I think they showed virus particles in the cells, right? By uh, EM? Not from clinical samples, I don't think. Just in culture, right? Okay, they yeah. showed, they had, they showed a uh, spike protein, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Well, there are not a lot of studies, right? Um so they say, you know, one report quantification of our RNA in the heart, two other studies used EM to de detect virus, and one detected viral RNA, but no particles in the heart. Uh, another study found particles in interstitial cells, but not myocytes. So they say it's therefore more likely that injury in patients occurs by inflammation rather than direct infection, but we need more data. There isn't a lot on on clinical specimens from pe from patients, basically. So I think there are a lot of hints that the heart is clearly a target and, and maybe fusion plays a role in disrupting the heart, but we need more. Uh, the next section is the immune system. They say no viral replication is observed in immune cells from patients. Would you agree with that, Brianne, from what you can tell? Um, from what I can tell, I would agree with that. There were a couple of early papers um, that... Yeah. reported uh, similar types of things. But when you actually really got into the nitty gritty of their data, yeah. um, it didn't seem to hold up. Um, and so I would agree with them that there isn't great evidence of any replication in immune cells. They say immune cells barely express ACE2 receptor. And uh, they believe most of the virus detected in immune cells is from by phagocytosis. So they don't think that they are a reservoir of the virus. And then they look in the digestive system. Uh, about 10 to 15% of patients have GI symptoms, including diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. 57% um, have um, positive PCR for stool, irrespective of disease severity. Um, and so two reports have found infectious virus in stool samples. But that... That doesn't seem like a lot. You would think there would be a lot more if it were really shed consistently in stool, right? Yeah, you do. You yeah. would. They say no report shown or evidence of fecal oral transmission. Although I, I remember SARS-1, there was a evidence for a fecal plume caused by faulty plumbing in an apartment complex, right? Um, they talk about presence in saliva, which uh, we know because... People have been using saliva for diagnostic tests, right? Um, but uh, let's see. Yeah, ex vivo organoids can be infected, right? Sim similar situation with the heart, but whether uh, it's infecting people is not clear, they say. Further studies are need needed to know uh, where the virus might be reproducing in the gut, if it is at all. And then they, they mention other organs of the digestive tract, liver, gallbladder, pancreas. And, you know, you see liver injury in some of the patients, evidenced by release of liver enzymes. But um, they don't know if, if, in fact, there's virus reproduction there or it's immune damage. Urinary tract, there is uh, abnormalities of the urine in COVID-19 patients, you know, protein, blood, leukocytes in the urine. 27% urine. Um, of hospitalized patients develop renal failure. And you can see tubule degeneration, necrosis, and thrombosis, which are there. And um, again, you can see viral RNA proteins and particles in the kidney tubular epithelium and other cells. In the, in the kidney. Um, and the virus can also infect kidney organoids and culture. So there's more evidence that the virus might be reproducing in kidney. This is, this is a, a place where I have a, a I, I had a closer look because yeah. I was particularly interested in the electron microscopy. <clears throat> and I went and looked into uh, several of the uh, references that reported electron microscopy uh, electron microscopic images of virus particles in the kidney 
from clinical samples, uh, autopsy samples, um, because there was a paper some time ago that Vincent, I think both you and I talked about that claimed to see virus particles in kidney tissues mm. that was not at all convincing. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I had a close look at these guys and there's, there's about four different papers that report electron microscopy. And, you know, I've looked at a fair number of electron micrographs and these uh, show particles that uh, are look quite like coronavirus particles, the whole crown, the spikes, all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not used to looking at coronavirus infections, but uh, in contrast to that earlier paper that you and I talked about, I found these studies pretty compelling. Um, I, I neglected to actually look closely and see whether they were the right size. And I would like to see something like immunogold staining that show that these light up with the appropriate antigen. But uh, the data that was there was much more convincing than uh, something that I've uh, seen before. So I'm coming away from this okay. thinking, yeah, could be there's virus in the kidneys. Curiously, though, there's, there's very little shedding in urine. Three to four percent of COVID-19 patients, uh, they could detect RNA in urine. So. I mean, as you see, most of these cases, with the exception of the respiratory tract, we need to do a lot more work. Reproductive system. No fertility problems or other genital... Sorry, I was muted. I wanted to say, oh. point out, they did find <laughs> infectious virus in one urine uh, sample. And if you think about it, uh, since we used to try to get virus out of urine, it's a nasty way to have to start with a sample and not kill your tissue culture cells. So yeah, um, it might be that there's more than that. Yeah. Um, viral proteins have been found in um, cells of the male reproductive tract of one patient, no, but didn't have cells didn't have any abnormalities, not in any female reproductive tract cells so far. So they say maybe uh, the male tract is susceptible and permissive. Um, there have been vascular abnormalities seen in up to 50% of, of placentas that have been examined, but no evidence for vertical transmission to infants. Um, infants can be infected uh, horizontally or and breastfeeding has been uh, suggested, viral RNA in five out of 42 breastfeeding mothers, but no one has uh, recovered our, uh, infectious virus from RNA positive milk samples. I say maybe it's not possible to pass it on to infants. And then we have the nervous system. Most patients, 78% have neurological symptoms, <clears throat> Headache, loss of smell and taste, imbalance, impaired consciousness. We heard a lot of these last Wednesday on our long COVID episode. <clears throat> so viral RNA has been found in four out of eight cerebrospinal fluid samples. That's a kind of the gold standard. If you think your virus is reproducing in the brain, you should be able to find it in CSF. Now, I should say that <clears throat> we, we know that enterovirus 68 is reproducing uh, in the brain, but we can't find it in CSF. So it's, and even polio, you don't find in every person virus in the CSF. Yet it's still, if you can find it there, it, it's suggestive. Um, but they they conclude it remains unclear whether the, all these neuro, neurological manifestations are, are caused by virus or other disturbances. Uh, although we know that in the uh, case of loss of smell, the virus is clearly reproducing in the sustentacular cells that support the olfactory neurons, uh, and that's not the neurons themselves. So I would say, again, very little evidence for direct virus reproduction in the, in the central nervous system. Uh, the eye, uh, eye symptoms are rare, but they've been reported. Uh, no one has cultivated virus from any of these patients with conjunctivitis, although they suggest that maybe virus could get in the eye. You know, once the virus gets in the eye, it can go through the nasolacrimal canal, which goes down to the nose and might be able to infect the respiratory tract. So that's why we tell people who are in constant contact with patients to wear uh, eye protection as well. No reports that virus could be isolated from ocular fluids. How about the skin? 20% of patients uh, have skin manifestations. 
Um, but no virus has been detected uh, in any of these rashes. Adipose tissue, no virus has been detected. So no evidence um, to either demonstrate or exclude that skin and adipose tissue harbors virus particles. And that that's basically it. Um, I think the, mo the bottom line for me is that obviously the main site of reproduction is the respiratory tract. Virus apparently can get out and move to other places, whether it's really reproducing in those other places and causing problems, I don't think we know yet. What do yeah, you, you guys think? I was just going to say there are lots of places where they mention um, things that are seen clinically here in some of these different organs that could be related to things like clotting issues um, or some of the things we were talking about with the previous paper. Right. They talk about the limitations of their study and it includes things like um, it was a lot of things tend to be from easily sampled uh, tissues or fluids and uh, that this was stu a study based on preprints. It was also based on literature from a certain time point. And so I know of a preprint about uh, prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in human postmortem ocular tissues. Uh, I haven't checked out whether it's gotten accepted yet, but uh, that's not mentioned here. But that's because this study that I'm referring to came out in October. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Their timeline was June. Uh, does anybody remember? I think when it was June. Their timeline right? ended. Yeah, uh, it was, it's quite a while ago. Like, yeah. So uh, yeah, January uh, through June twenty third. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a limitation. I think there's yeah. a lot more that we could be learning. Yeah. Um, in the intervening time. I also keep in mind that the uh, autopsy samples come from people who died. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay. those are pretty severe cases. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right, let's do let's do one. So this round. is good. I mean, if you have questions about uh, about disseminated disease, this is a great review. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's nice to have this all in one place. Yeah, let's do one round of email. Okay, uh, the first one's from Gina. I'm writing from Austin, Texas. Wow, where's that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It's too warm for November, but I'm not complaining. I love the podcast. I most often listen when walking my dog at Lake Pflugerville. Is, is that a thing, Rich? Lake Pflugerville? Yeah, it's up in the north. I may be in Texas, but I definitely listen to the very end of every episode. <laughs> I don't know. In TWIV 679, the statement was made that everyone should take calcium. And I know that's not true, at least for me. I cannot take calcium because my body does some weird thing with it. If I take too much, I get kidney stones. If I if I don't take enough, my body leeches it from my bones and I feel horrible. I've been on HCTZ plus potassium for decades. My doctor tells me this combo fakes out my system versus fixing things. I don't have kidney stones anymore, so I appreciate it. But I wonder if that puts me at an increased risk for COVID-19. Also, my mom has been in Austin with us since the end of February. She's from the Northwest Florida and rode back with me after I took a road trip to Mardi Gras this year. I was so lucky not to have been infected. She's really itching to get back home, and I really would like her to stay put and hunker down for a few more months. Not only has my brother, who lives with her, taken a job in a hospital, I'm not sure she could resist seeing her youngest grandchildren that don't live with her. I got her hooked on TWIV several months ago to help relieve her anxiety with real information. Vincent, she said she will listen to you. Could you please advise her to stay put? Her name is Elaine. <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Elaine, you should stay put. Right now is not a yeah. good time to be moving around. And I think my co-hosts will all agree. You know? The several months thing I think is reasonable. I was listening and heard Scott Gottlieb, who's the former head of the FDA, mm -hmm. yesterday said that he thinks that we may not be around the corner on this surge until around the end of January. Yeah. Uh, but he was talking about potentially being around the corner. And who knows, by then, some of these millions of doses of RNA vaccines may be starting yeah. to get deployed. So. Uh, if she could hang on a little bit longer, it would probably be good. I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, if for a lot of people, it doesn't feel like it, but the disease burden nationwide right now is worse than it has ever been. Much worse Much than worse. it has ever been. Okay. This is, this is so far the worst time yet in the pandemic, and it's still accelerating. Okay. Yeah. 
So the and and I keep saying this, nobody's listening. Okay. <laughs> I think that the disease burden is directly proportional to our community behavior. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And and you can this has been demonstrated over and over again. So the way to manage this is to stay put, wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands. And depending on how you look at the graphs, whether you want to call this the second wave or the third wave, it's huge. It's, yeah, it's the huge. biggest surfing wave you've ever seen pictured. It's yep. a tsunami. It's, yeah. 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 I mean, I think people need to think about the fact that back when we were, when people were all really scared and, you know, uncertain in, you know, April, um, the numbers are worse now. Yeah. Um, we know more, but the numbers are a lot worse. Yeah. And people are dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Dear Twiv, I've been a Twiv groupie since February. And if there were posters of Brianne, Vincent, Dixon, Rich, <laughs> Kathy, and Alan, they would adorn my bedroom. <laughs> it's funny. During your discussion of the case of the new mother who died suddenly, having only a cough before she lay down, Amy Rosenfeld described in clear detail the findings of in the heart muscle myocardium at autopsy involving the T-tubules and the general meltdown of the syncytium, which is the anatomic structure through which the electrical impulses of heart muscle cells transmit. Having done a long ago fellowships in both cardiology and endocrinology, I heard this description and your analysis with different ears. Everyone seemed to agree the patient died of heart failure, which has a specific meaning in clinical and pathological practice. The heart's main function is to pump blood forward in an orderly manner. It is fundamentally a pump. To do this, it needs electrical physiology. What you were clearly describing is a situation in which dysrhythmia, electrical impulse disarray occurred. This new mother almost certainly died of a dysrhythmia, not heart failure, which is why her death was so sudden and nearly asymptomatic. The ultimate endpoint of heart failure is pulmonary edema in which fluid backs up into the lung alveoli, and this would likely have been seen at autopsy. Dysrhythmia is not an autom auto bleh, anatomic finding and cannot be seen at autopsy. Your folks commented on how we might detect heart damage from SARS-CoV-2, and there are many ways. One, a resting EKG can see QT intervals, which correlate with major disturbances in calcium channels. Two, echocardiograms can show ejection fractions, which are a good correlate with pump function. Three, there is even such a thing as a heart biopsy, which, while is only rarely done, is a technique pioneered by Bernadine Healy whilst, when she was at Hopkins. Calcium physiology is, like most things in biology, not simple, but oral calcium has little or no impact on blood or tissue calcium levels. If it did, we'd probably not survive. There is a very tenacious gatekeeper in the intestine, 125 vitamin D, which allows only a calibrated amount of calcium to enter the bloodstream from the gut, although this can, though this can be overwhelmed by well-meaning folks who think they are doing their bones or heart, hearts a favor. I love TWIV and all you have taught me about T cells, B cells, protein spikes over the last, these past nine months. But sometimes when you float into clinical worlds, I wish I had a buzzer to alert you and interject when you get carried away. Keep up the good work. As I write today, Pfizer has just announced the early results of its vaccine trials and people are talking about President-elect Joe Biden. And there may be, once again, a place for science in the, these United States of America. And that's from Neil. Um, who is a humble local endocrinologist. So I was just looking at the manuscript, and indeed they they conclude that the lady uh, died of a dysrhythmia, arrhythmia, a fatal a electromechanical dysfunction in fatal arrhythmia. Yeah, and this is a nice description. It gives me a clear picture of how pathologically at autopsy you would uh, this would you would be able to distinguish between a standard heart attack and and this. Very good. Appreciate that. Yes, we do drift off uh, into the boundaries or beyond of our expertise. And this is why we rely on our listeners. We appreciate the feedback. Yes, thank and you. I know very little cardiology, so thank you very much, Neil. <laughs> and Brianne, you did a, a noble job of pronouncing the uh, syncytium, but I, I looked it up in 
Google and it says, did you mean syncytium? Yeah, so just, I think the anatomic spelled. structure is is actually a syncytium. Okay. Yeah. I, it, I wanted to say syncytium, but I... <laughs> I, know, I know. And it was one. Of, it's one of those things where in Google, nothing comes up. It's very rare, uh, except one, uh, one flashcard thing that looks like it's a wrong thing. So, yeah. Kathy, can you take the next one? Yaroslava writes, Dear TWIV team, I wanted to write to you for a long time. I am just a postdoc working on biophysics of membrane proteins. My heart beats for sodium pump. Since <laughs> Illinois is hit by the COVID tsunami, I love the paper you discussed in TWIV 679 about the calcium tsunami. Our lab is working on calcium handling in the heart, and I heard about the paper. I had to share it with everyone I know in the field. I love your podcast and your enthusiasm. I've followed you since March and I'm not going to stop. I may appear mad to the lab since I'm listening to you during microscopy and I'm laughing a lot with my mask and headphones on. I was currently exposed to a COVID case, so I'm following Tetris. Most of the things you talked about are perfectly useful now and I seem to be very smart because I am asking, what is your CT value? Unfortunately, my family is in the Czech Republic. It's a red COVID spot in the middle of Europe. And my husband works in Richland, Washington State. Despite all the complications this year, I am grateful for my family, friends, and job. I even started a small garden during COVID 2020, which would be hard when being in the lab the whole day long. I would love to write a poem may win, and may win one of the books, but I am no poet. But a while ago, your video inspired me to make handmade pillow covers with science. See the attached photos. Stay safe, stay grumpy, and COVID negative. Thank you, Yaroslava. So uh, she sent these pictures. One is the structure uh, of it's several pillows, and the structure on the right is her sodium potassium ATPase, hmm. and then uh, another one is the structure of ATP thirteen A two, and these are really great. They're the, very nice. The They're really yeah. cool. Yeah, so we got a phage, so and in the back she's got uh, virus particles, right? <clears throat> Yeah, she's got yes. a phage. I like that got, one. Yeah, some other viruses. Yeah, very yeah. nice. In the back is l yeah. lovely with all the different viruses. Look at that. Nice. Yeah. Yes, f f uh, virus pillows are all the thing now. <laughs> yes. You can see because, one behind uh, Kathy. Alan and Vincent have had theirs for show. I got mine out today. I ah, yes. Yeah. Good. Where's yours, Rich? <laughs> I guess I'll have to get mine out. Yeah. Thanks again to Jolene and uh, for convincing her mom to make us these pillows. Where's yours, Rich? Uh... It's over in the corner. I can oh, I don't have to get it. I'm just making sure you know where it is. It's okay. It's, it's around. Rich, can you take the, the next one? Uh, okay. Dirk writes, Dear Vincent et al., a report on SARS-2 in Belgium from the top of the second wave. The sun is shining, and it will not get above 12C today. So beautiful autumn. Since three days, we are again in semi-lockdown. Bars, restaurants, non-essential shops and schools are closed. Non-urgent care in hospitals is delayed. Now that's when you're really getting slammed, okay? And it starts to impact on non-COVID cases. Non-urgent care in hospitals is delayed and the IECU is filling up. 75% full and increasing. And we might be at the top of new cases peak but peak in hospital admissions and deaths are still to come. The hope is that the number of ICU beds will be enough. Workforce is the main bottleneck. The second wave is about 20% higher than the first, so the main question is, how did we get here again? There must be natural factors, uh, cold, wetter, less sunshine. We all want schools open. <clears throat> so in September, everything started but only with basic precautions, hand wash, mask, ventilation. This is not enough. And the traffic before and after school also has a huge impact. When schools start again in two weeks from now, more measures will be in place, distancing, uh, greater than 50% online teaching. The main cause of the second peak may be the mentality of the population. Absolutely. We were feeling okay during September. There was a gradual increase in uh, cases, but we had smaller peaks during the summer as well. We were again negotiating for a government uh, Belgian hobby, <laughs> and nobody wanted to make a strong point about the virus. Government changed and composition of the Bureau of Advisors towards less 
biomedicists and more economists, despite strong protests, the biomedical community. And then cases to start, started to increase dramatically in the 20 or 30 year olds. Uh, it was uh, first the Walloon region and Brussels. We are a tiny country that is further divided and every region can decide stuff themselves. So when one region closes restaurants, people just drive to another region. When one region gets in trouble, uh, the other region has a tendency to say, uh, look, we're doing better and not take any measures. Um, just a little uh, time out here. There was a Facebook meme running around that I really love that's saying that putting restrictions on one area locally and not on another is like having a section in your pool where people can pee. <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking of a, of a cockroach thing where like if there's a bunch of apartments and one gets bombed for roaches, then the roaches all go to the other apartments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also in Belgium, politicians behave like toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> not only in Belgium, dude. Uh, one made the comment, not installing the Corona app because I don't trust the national government. And the leader of the Flemish region, I'm not starting to put out a fire when the house is not burning. Uh, and a few days ago, and a few days later, the plan for a national lockdown was announced. This was on a Friday, but since the lockdown started on a Monday, there was a last big shopping weekend in several main cities with crowded streets and people lining up in front of stores. Yeah, I've never understood this. We're going to lock down three days from now. We're <laughs> going to close the bars day <laughs> after tomorrow. <laughs> City mayors could have prevented this, but did not. People working in the hospitals were furious. Anyway, very, very frustrating. The virus killed one in a thousand of the population during a first wave, it's unbelievable that we are again at the absolute limit of what our hospitals can do, and it may get worse. This wave really took us by surprise, but if some politicians would do be more realistic, we could do a lot to prevent it. I realize they will not win a prize for being careful, prevention paradox, or self-defeating prophecy, but they have to a job, but they have a job to do. Love the show. It's a great resource for me. So easy to get updated just by uh, letting it flow into my ears. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, he's a PhD research manager at a laboratory of virology and chemotherapy. So yeah, Dirk, thanks for the news. I mean, it's like, this is, this is the way it is. And I, you know, uh, Francis Collins was on the PBS News Hour the other night, and he was giving the right message. But one of the things I wanted him to say was, you know, you don't have to wait for somebody to close the bars. Okay, this uh, uh, this could be what we need is a, a this will never happen. But what we need is a grassroots movement. Every individual needs to understand their responsibility to the community and do the right thing. You don't have to close the bars. People just need to quit going, okay? You don't have to close the restaurants. People just need to quit going. Everybody has a responsibility to this, okay? Am I broadcasting to the whole world here? Yeah, you bet. No, I'm preaching to the <laughs> choir, right? <laughs> well, in yeah. theory. The, I have to tell people that um, having a beer on your couch in your PJs with your friends on Zoom is a lot of fun and you can even hear better than in a bar. <laughs> uh, I know Dirk, he's a virologist. I've met him a number of times. Uh, so thanks for writing. Okay, let's do some picks. Brianne, what's your pick today? So my pick is a documentary. Um, I've been pretty interested in this one for a while. Um, it was a little tricky for me to get to see it, um, and I wanted to wait until I actually watched it before I uh, picked it, but this it's called Picture a Scientist. Um, I became particularly interested in science communication, actually, when I learned about something called the Draw a Scientist um, set of experiments that people have been doing for years where kids were asked to draw a scientist and they always drew white men, um, even the little girls. And um, so 
this is a documentary about um, women in science, issues that women have had in science, and also kind of moving forward um, with the same idea of how do you picture what a scientist is or how do you draw what a scientist is. Um, it was part of the Tribeca Film Festival and won some awards. Um, I was able to see it um, as part of the American Society of um, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I had to suddenly think what those um, letters stood for. <laughs> And um, I know that there are a number of groups that are having showings. Um, you can get uh, a, a screening for your group. Um, there are, if you Google online, you can actually um, find some screenings um, that are pretty reasonably pl priced pretty easily um, by a number of different groups. But I found it to be um, really informative and also really inspiring. Um, to watch and hear about um, sort of women in science. And so I highly recommend it if you can get a chance to see this uh, documentary. So down the, down the page here, they have a section called Meet the Scientists. Uh, are these the people who are interviewed in the show? They have Nancy Hopkins, Rachelle Burks, and mm -hmm. Jane Willenbring. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. Yes. Okay. So they are all uh, involved. Um, oh, look, someone has just put something in that um, there's access by uh, American Acad American AAAS. <laughs> if you're a member of AAAS, uh, you can reserve your space uh, by November 24th for screenings from December 2nd through 9th. Uh, this would be for me probably the fourth or fifth opportunity I've had to see it. Um, it is really good, as Brianne said. So if, if you're a member of AAAS, uh, you can check that out. You should have gotten an email I got mine on November 4th. Um, it's really worth watching. It's very worth your time if it's a, something that you can um, screen. There are a lot of groups that are having screenings and then panel discussions or things like that. Um, and, and I just got so much out of watching it. Cool. Neat. Kathy, what do you have? Uh, Vincent, we couldn't hear you. I don't know why I'm speaking the same way. Yeah, it, it, that's the third time that it's happened. I, I noted the first one earlier. So somehow your your audio is cutting out. You know, what does way. it do? Just cut out completely? Yeah, yeah just that's hear. like you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Anyway, did you say, Kathy, what's your pick? I said. <laughs> because I can go ahead and do that. Kathy, what's <laughs> your pick? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I picked two short things. One is uh, another astronomy picture of the day from um, November 11th. It's colors of the moon and a, a photographer in Italy took these pictures over a, a good long time span. And it's just beautiful pictures of the moon in all kinds of different colors. And he's arranged them in a spiral, <laughs> yellow, purple, blue, red, uh, orange. Uh, it, it's just a really cool photo. And because it was Italy, I, I thought Vincent might like it's it. Very cool. The second Lovely. one is a, a a word one, and that is a word that has not changed its sound or meaning in eight thousand years, and that's locks. Hmm. Now that doesn't mean it hasn't changed its spelling, but um, in uh, Proto Indo European, the pro pronunciation was locks, and it meant salmon, and now it. Uh, specifically means smoked salmon, but it's pretty cool that after 8,000 years, this word is still pronounced the same. Probably no other word is like that. I think that's the case. Wow. Yeah. I love, it looks great what they have there, that sesame, <laughs> the picture of that uh, <laughs> poppy <laughs> bagel <laughs> with cream cheese. And, oh boy, I'm hungry. Looks good. <laughs> we know what Vincent's going to go have for lunch. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any of those components. It was just going to be yogurt today. I'm sorry to say. Uh, so Rich an interesting substitute, if you don't have lox, yeah. is a slice of fresh tomato. Um, but yeah. everything else the same. So try that sometime, even if you don't have lox, but you have the other things. Yeah, tomatoes work. Mm -hmm. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I picked the NASA YouTube channel. Uh, I've always been a bit of a space nut, but with Kate orbiting again, I'm space nuttier. And I was looking for a way to really keep up with all their videos. If you look at their regular NASA channel, it's only a selection, but this is their YouTube channel. So you can find all the compilations. Uh, in particular, uh, the most recent two are a total of 40 minutes covering uh, the very recent launch of 
Crew Dragon 2 with four astronauts up to the space station. They're launch and they're docking with the space station. So there's now seven guys there, and or seven people there, includes two women. Uh, if you look further down, you'll see the uh, NASA's version of the podcast with Kate. Hmm, but at any rate, that. if you want to keep up with all of the NASA videos, and they do a great job, uh, this is the place to go. And mm -hmm. I, uh, cool. if you haven't paid any attention to the Crew Dragon launch, uh, I'm just blown away. Just blown away. I'm as blown away by the fact that they can recover the first stage landing on a floating platform as anything else. <laughs> and now we've made two references to the additional uh, TWIV podcast that came out yesterday, TWIV 682, uh, with Kate Rubens, Vincent, and Rich. So if you somehow have missed seeing that in your feed, you'll want to go and probably watch that because the video is awesome. Vincent did a really good job of editing it, and uh, it's got some great questions and uh, Kate had been on TWIV before, so she knew the routine, gave us the weather. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so and she also out. said that they, she listens to TWIV up there on the weekends. That's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, NASA actually, I mean, she can't just, she can't just stream it from the space station. Yeah, they send it to her. by request, yeah. NASA packages the podcast and sends them up to her. Yeah. It's, uh, this is cool. cool. They have, uh, the, as you said, uh, they have our, with here in their own version, you can see how they edited it and put it together. I was actually uh, curious that she had a wired microphone because I've seen other interviews and they have a wireless mic yes. that they hold, right. but she had a wired one that really looked like a toothbrush. It had a very tiny it did. Yeah. tip. Yeah. When I first I looked on the video, I thought, that's weird. She's showing them how she brushes her teeth. It's very funny. And the other funny thing was that the guy... Whoever is at the beginning was connecting station, uh, you know, are you ready for the event? And she goes, ready. And then he goes, this week in virology podcast, and he couldn't pronounce virology. <laughs> and I'm thinking, really, with all this going on, you can't pronounce <laughs> virology. Well, we have trouble with clinical terms. And it was twice well. at the right. end when he signed yeah. off. Right. He said, this yeah. week in vi virology, thank you. <laughs> It's very funny. I'm not making fun of you. I just think it's amusing in the pandemic for 10 months, you know? You know what I mean? Well, uh, I really appreciate uh, what NASA did. Yeah, they, we appreciate yeah. it. It was uh, great. It really went out of the And uh, great. people seem to like it. So uh, glad you like it. Anyway, my pick is uh, an artist called Laura Splon. Now, this uh, been doing a series of artist picks who do science stuff. And uh, I had originally found this because she, she does exhibits and she has one series of projects called Viral Artifacts, which she says examines our comfort and discomfort with the microbial world in a series of sculptures, animations, prints, and drawings. And I originally had found the, the doilies. She has lace sculptures based on virus structures, which I thought years ago I found this, but then it turns out she's in Brooklyn and she has a she has a space where she has exhibits, and um, <clears throat> she's on. I follow her on Instagram, and I really I'm thinking of getting her onto Twiv one of these days to talk about what you know she sees. It's really cool. There's this other project called Remote uh, Disruptions. It's called Rematerializes Hidden Artifacts of Biotechnology in a Series of Network Devices and recorded Zoom performances with scientists and lab workers. She has this vortex genie here, which I think is really funny. And then another guy playing an electric guitar in front of liquid nitrogen tanks. So, you know, it's this mix of life and science, and it's very cool. Laura Splon. I really like these um, <laughs> uh, these animated, basically kaleidoscopic kinetic art things that uh, use as their basis uh uh, crystallographic structures. Yes, that's her latest thing, yeah. And she uh, had... And, uh, you know, I've always thought that these structures are beautiful. Uh, and she really uh, uh, uses that. And so even if you don't understand the structures, you can see the beauty in them, uh, the way she's animated them. It's really great. There are so many fantastic things on here. Yes. I, I'm sort of liking the one called Needle in a Haystack. 
mm-hmm. um, which seems which is sort of found objects and things one observes in the lab, like the you know yeah. system okay message yeah. on the machines and things. That, I just thought that was that was cool to sort of focus on those types of things. Well, I was interested in figuring out where the science uh, creeps yeah. into her art, okay. and uh, it was hard to find like a complete bio on her educational background and stuff. She's primarily an artist, but apparently there's some training in biology in her background somewhere. Uh, uh, I couldn't find the specifics on it. I, I see. On it, have you been to her studio? I've ever? never been. No, but on Instagram she has pictures of it, and she apparently recently moved into a new space. And I'm very jealous because it's a big space in Brooklyn, and love to have studio space there you will uh yeah and anyway so i think it would be fun to have her on and just talk about where she's coming from right yeah and kathy you found uh one of the artists i had been thinking about right right uh so at the university of maryland asv 2018 we had four science artists and uh so vincent has talked about michelle banks our logica uh uh, Peggy Muddles, the vexed muddler, trilobite glassworks, and Jessica Beals was the other one who does these uh, paper pieces from handmade papers where she uses overbeaten plant fibers shrunk over armatures. As the paper dries, it becomes taut, translucent skin or coating. And so they are very interesting objects uh, that yes. Vincent told us about I on remember. last Friday's yeah. Twiv. So she was. I went to her her uh, stand and she had this one of these hanging up, which I said, "How much is it?" it was two thousand dollars. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And you also found a listener pick, Kathy. Yes. So Mona uh, sent a reference for me uh, several weeks ago. Uh, she sent it on November sixth. So I think it was the show that we did on November fourth, maybe where there was an ad five vector that was modified to reduce the ad five immunity but I couldn't figure out how it was modified. And she sent the reference for that. It's deleted for early region 2B genes, the DNA polymerase, and the precursor for the terminal protein, which is not what Rich and I guessed at all. We thought it was somehow modified, uh, one of the structural proteins. But by modifying the viral polymerase and the terminal protein, it reduces the structural gene expression. And so that was... Uh, what she said about that. And the way she knows about this is because she's been following podcasts of Immunity Bio, which is the company that had used that vector. And the founder of that company also owns the LA Times and so has uh, somehow sponsored by the LA Times a podcast. And so she sent that. Um, and his name is Dr. Patrick Sun Shang. He's some kind of clinician. I can't remember, maybe cardiologist or something. And uh, she in particular sent a nice interview that included graphics that he drew uh, with Shane Crotty and Alessandro Setti. Um, and she said, you know, you could skip right to nine minutes and 22 seconds. So I, I did watch that podcast, but I haven't watched any of the others in that series. But uh, it looks like a good series if they're... Uh, as good as this one was. So thanks, Mona. Hmm, Cool. All right. That is TWIV 683. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send us questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And for the month of November, if you donate to parasiteswithoutborders.com, they will match your donation and give it right back to microbe.tv. We'd love your assistance. And we thank Daniel Griffin for doing that for us. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Uh, Always a good time. Great time. Great time. Brian Barker is at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>